Would you say, because you were a good tennis player, do you think that's opened up more doors for you? 100%. Like now, I, I feel proud of what I, what I achieved. But like when you're in the moment, you don't actually realise. I mean, obviously, everyone would say, I wish I could go back in time and appreciate exactly what I've what I done or what, what you achieved. So like now I look at it and think, bloody hell, like I've done, I done half all right. There's literally no reason why I stopped. I probably had my best year. I won like 12 tournaments. I was a very good doubles player. I mean, yeah, I don't think I could have maybe broke the top 100 singles. Mm -hmm. The doubles, I mean, I mean, people say it now, I could have been top 50 easy, top 20. I mean, look, in hindsight, you've got to obviously do it. But I, I think, yeah, I'm, I missed an opportunity. I'm probably a bit gutted about that a little bit. But yeah, oh, yeah, I can't put a finger on why I stopped, really. So I've got a I've got a very very special guest who is in front of me. I've been dying to get him on the podcast for some time. For me, this is quite a special one because you're actually a friend of mine. Um, I think you're the first person that um, you've got a very inspiring story and um, someone I got to know very very well. And I'm not just saying this just because you're here, but I feel like you've been a friend of mine for like ten or fifteen years. You came to my wedding recently in uh, Amanti. And we just gel. And even my mum and dad, they was like, Lewis is such a lovely guy. Um, can't believe you've only known him for like a year or so. And um, I just think we've gelled so well. Um, yeah. Plus we're doing business together and we've got so many more things to look forward to. So welcome on board, Lewis Burton. Um, Thanks for having me. I want to call this podcast the, the true Lewis Burton. Um, there's took, a me, took me a while to come on here, but yeah. I'm here in the end. Well, um, I, I think there's a lot of like things that I've seen, um, even in like the papers and stuff, that I feel that you should correct. So hence why we're doing the podcast. But before we get into that, I want to just talk about your background being a tennis player. I had a uh, uh, a guest on recently, a guy called James Ward, um, professional tennis player, and yep. someone that you've introduced me to, and he's going to become a Richard Hamilton collector, etc. Yep. Fantastic guy, really enjoyed, enjoyed that podcast. But obviously, he speaks very, very highly of you. And he said, as an athlete and your mindset when you used to play tennis full time and be dedicated to it, you were kind of, kind of ruthless when it came down to like training, being on point, dedicated to your craft. So um, let's start from the beginning again. Uh, yep. Beginning. Um, being an athlete then, how did you get into tennis? Why did you get into tennis? And why did you take that sport up? Um, yeah, how did I get into tennis? Well, as, as a young 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 guy, young boy, I've, your parents give you every sport, football, tennis, swimming, whatever it is. Yeah. Uh, my brother used to be a decent tennis player. Uh, we used to, we started down Bexley Tennis Club and I always remember my brother, I joined in at the end of his sessions, like 10, 15 minutes. Yeah. Then as, as the years went on, brother didn't really, didn't really like it. So I kind of, I kind of started playing more and then, then I took on his lessons and then I think it was like, I was, seven at the time when I started didn't know really how good I was and I, I entered <coughs> the, ca the county clothes like it's the, it's the Kent sort of where I'm from so I I've done a very similar one uh, for squash yeah. you should enter the Kent close and then the southeast and then yeah, the nat it. national yeah. um but yeah I was I was a Kent champion for squash oh nice so yes. I can resonate with yes, what I, you're I, saying I, now under 12s I got it I, I entered that and <coughs> I, I won it so then that's when obviously my, my parents thought I must be pretty decent at this sport. So I carried it on and then, yeah, that was it really. Yeah. So um, you're a fucking tall geezer. How tall are you? 6'4". You would you say that gives you an advantage being a tennis player? Uh, yeah, a little bit. But I mean, it's, it's, I mean, I was lucky. I was very, I was very quick around the court. So I mean, yeah, like James, James Ward said, I was, I was a good athlete. So I, all the... All the uh, like the fitness tests, I smashed it with flying colours. So I'm lucky I wasn't tall and moved like a bit of a bus. Yeah. Well, even still now, I mean, we've been to the gym together. We've mm. done the box hill running on Saturday. And for everybody who's listening, I mean, I've got a guy who can vouch for me. Them box hill runs oh, are mate. fucking tough. Very doesn't tough. Doesn't matter how, how, how fit you are. You could be the fittest boxer or athlete in the world. It, it definitely catches up with you. Mm. So, um, but being an athlete then, I'm, I'm always intrigued, being a boxer myself, the kind of things that you went through. Now, James Ward gave me an insight, but mm. from, your, from, from your point of view, what did you have to do to become a very, very good tennis player? Um, yeah, I mean, it's dedication. I mean, like, my lifestyle now is totally different. I mean, I didn't, didn't drink. 
don't go out, you don't really have a social life, so it's just everything, every day, is you wake up, yeah, eat, sleep, is tennis, everything's tennis, fitness. I mean, you, I mean, waking up at seven in the mornings, we're, we're down at breakfast with everyone, because I trained at the NTC, mm. and there was, um, yeah, you're doing five hours a day. I mean, it's pretty boring stuff, but it's just repetitive, and it's, yeah, it shapes you into into a good to anything you do really right yeah I and mean, if you do, do it enough it's going to shape you into a great great professional yeah and um would you say you're like more of a defensive tennis player or attacking no very attacking very attacking yeah i had a good serve um i loved, still- loved coming to the net decent backhand forehand let me down a little bit I, yeah i wasn't i always I always aggressive just brung brung them out so when i used to play it was like i had a game plan and I'd stick to it. It's like I, I kind of win or lose matches sort of thing. Mm-hmm. It wasn't like I'd, I'd be waiting for the other guy to miss. It's I'm bringing it to him. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, so uh, I remember you were telling me that you used to travel around the world quite a bit as a young a young kid. Um, I didn't have the same sort of thing. I wasn't. Tra- I only went to Holland once to play for for for, for the country. Uh, so I got a very very small taste of that being a you know playing playing squash as a kid. Would you say you had to sacrifice a lot of your childhood in order to become a very, very good tennis player? I mean, what was the weekends like? I mean, was it just time, time dedicated to your to to your yeah, tennis? Yeah, I mean, I didn't. Uh, luckily, I've got a good group of friends around me still now from school. Luckily, but I left school in year in year ten, so I got no, I have no grades. Um, but obviously, I experienced an amazing life that people don't don't get to see. Um, Where were some of the best places you travelled to to play tennis? Um, Best place. Do you, do you know what? One of the best places I've been. I went to South America for six weeks. Mm-hmm. It's probably my worst tennis experience. I won one match, but I mean, for the whole experience, I went to Paraguay, Argentina, Chile. I mean, see them sort of <coughs> places when you're a young kid. But I only won one match. It was on. It was on clay, and I've, I wasn't the best on that. But yeah. I mean, for the experience, it was amazing. What what I always say about my perception, this is just my perception of of tennis, is it, it falls into the same category category in my own mind as something like golf or maybe slightly Formula One, but I would say more so golf. Not that it's similar in in the style of of play, but the kind of um, demographic who's affiliated to it are fairly similar. Um, how the reason why I I kind of support that is because even when I've travelled with you to Marbella we went to Porto Romano and you go everyone knows you because of the, the tennis and mm-hmm. I went down to the Queen's Club which is in Kensington and everyone obviously it's, it's, a, it's a tennis place yeah. but there's that the kind of respect there you do get that in boxing but it's not like I rock up to a hotel and go oh do you want to have a, a spa you know mm-hmm. down down in the lobby yeah. but with tennis it's more like gentleman's kind of sport so oh. would you say because you were a good tennis player and because you was professional and, and, and obviously you were very very good at what you you done do you think that's opened up more doors for you? Hundred percent. I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, I just want to touch base on something. Like now, I, I feel proud of what I what I achieved. But like when you're in the moment, you don't actually you don't actually realise. I mean, obviously, everyone would say, "I wish I could go back in time and appreciate exactly what I, what I done or what what you achieved." So like now, I look at it and think, "Bloody hell! Like I done I done half all right." So yeah, that's one thing I'd love to do if I could go back and. And appreciate my my tennis days because because I, I basically stopped playing tennis. Mm. I think I was twenty two or twenty three, and there was there's literally no reason why I stopped. And I was kind I, I can't even tell you today why I didn't. I, I was I think at the time I was. Yeah. You didn't get injured. No, Did not injured. I mean, I literally I'd, I probably had my best year. I won like twelve tournaments. I was a very good doubles player. I mean, yeah, I, I don't think I could have maybe broke the top hundred singles. The doubles, I mean, I mean, people say it now, I could have been top 50 easy, top 20. I mean, look, in hindsight, you've got to obviously do it. But I, I think, yeah, I'm, I missed an opportunity. And I'm probably a bit gutted about that a little bit. But yeah, oh, yeah, I can't put a finger on why I stopped, really. Because, like, even some of the people that you brought to the table here at Woodbury, um, obviously, we're going to talk about your involvement with us later on. But I mean, a lot of them have come from either the Queen's Club or, or su- something affiliated to, you know, your, your tennis background and et cetera. You become a, a champion. I still still think you're champion at the Queen's Club. Yeah, I won all three at the Queen's. Um, what do you mean by all three? Um, so there's club champs every year. Yeah. The singles, uh, men's singles, men's doubles and men's, uh, and the mixed doubles. And I won, 
I won all three events. Well, the first year I played it, I won the, I lost in the semi-finals of singles, won the doubles and won the mixed doubles. And then a year later, I won all three in the same year. Obviously, I know what, I've only been to Queen's Club twice now, I think. I think twice. Yeah. Um, obviously, I know what it is. And it's a very sort of high, like it's got a high profile mm. kind of name. Um, and there's some well-to-do people there. Mm. Um, not just good tennis players, but very, very sharp, sophisticated, educated business people yeah. from all walks of life. But for the viewers, what is Queen's Club? Like, why is that such a big deal? I mean, Queen's Club was founded in 1886. I mean, it's probably, apart from Wimbledon, it's probably one of the best best clubs in the world. Um, I mean, everyone knows it. There's a warm-up tournament before Wimbledon. Um, I'm very lucky to be a member there. <coughs> I play for the teams, but I mean, yeah, I mean, just being a, being, a, it's funny as well, like you said, there's a lot of business people, very, very well educated, obviously, I'm not saying I'm, I'm not that well educated, but I mean, the, the respect that people give you, for obviously being a decent tennis player, or winning that, winning that championship, mm. I mean, yeah, it's amazing. I mean, I, I met, uh, he's a bit of a friend to us now at Woodbury, uh, the guy you brought in, a guy called Tom Miller. I think yeah. he's such a great guy. A mm. um, lot of respect for him, very educated, very, very sharp on the ball. Um, it's people like that you've, you've met down Queen's Club and you've, you've harnessed a bit of a, a, a good network down there. Yeah, I mean, Tom, Tom's a great friend of mine. Um, he's like a bit of a business mentor to me now as well. So, and he's an investor into Hamilton, into Woodbury as well. So Yeah, it's good stuff. He's a great friend. So uh, I, I ask this to James and I ask this to any athlete. Who is like a role model as far as athlete or a tennis player is concerned? Who would you say that you've met, you've looked up to, you've played against, who's really giving you that inspiration and, um, you know, motivation to push on um, as, as, as a tennis player? I mean, when I was younger, I loved Pete Sampras. Um, he was aggressive, at, wasn't he? Yeah, I mean, amazing. I was kind of... Pete Sampras and Tim Hemlin. Tim Hemlin was like kind of my favourite. That's what I based my game around on. Um, I'm lucky enough to, I was actually coached by Paul Anika and Pete Sampras's coach, which was an amazing experience when I was under 16s. Um, he worked for the OTA, that's like the Lawn Tennis Association. So he, uh, he coached me for about six months, amazing experience. We've done, um, done uh, pre-season in Saddlebrook in Florida. Okay. Amazing. And yeah, I've got luck, lucky enough, I've been on court with Tim Hemman as well. I mean, he's what an amazing player. Yeah. Um, you don't, I, I think... It's hard for the public because you don't realise how good these people were. Like, like Tim, Tim Hemman, for <coughs> example, he was four in the world, made semi-finals every Grand Slam. I mean, that is a massive achievement. But people say, oh, but he didn't, didn't win much or didn't, didn't win a Grand Slam. But you've got to remember, like you know, you're, you're, you're a boxer. Being at that level is just unbelievable. Oh, well, like, I, I hear it all the time. and I mean, there's a bit of a culture now with social media. There's like keyboard warriors. Mm. And, and these are typically people who have never done anything with their life. They're people that... Loud, you know, loud about, and they they they've never contributed towards the sport, but they've got so so many opinions. And even in boxing, I see it all the time. Oh, that person's only English title, or he's only British title. He can never be a world champion. Do you know what it takes to become British champion? Exactly. Do you know what it takes to even get into Wimbledon? I mean, you have no fucking idea. Well, even if you're not a professional, even if you're good at county standard, I mean, to be good at any any sort of level, it's an amazing achievement, right? Yeah. So. Yeah, I mean, keyboard warriors. I mean, I know a lot about that. Yeah, me, me too, mate. Um, so uh, you told me a very interest, interesting story. So you went from like pro tennis over to modelling. And I know you've modelled for a bunch of different people. You was even just telling me a minute ago about um, a company giving you a free holiday because you modelled for them, which is mm. amazing. I wish I could, I could get that <laughs> shit. Um, so I want some tips off of you later. Um <laughs> So how did that go about? If you don't mind sharing that story, because wasn't you in a, a restaurant near us yeah, called Prima yeah. Donnas yeah, yeah, and you was with like an ex or something and then someone asked you yeah, and, yeah. and before you knew it, you was you was signed up? Yeah, it's funny really. So I was, yeah, I was in Prima Donnas, like you said, and I, I was, my start, I was just, just come up and there was this lady that walked past my my table and it was a bit weird. So I said to, said to the person I was with at the time, I said, bloody hell, I said, who's that? And then she, it was like she was walking in the, into the glass and she turned around and she was like, stand up. I was like... Fuck me, confident. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I got up, I said, I was, what was that? I must have been 22, but at the time, you know, I didn't have much confidence, you know what I mean? So I stood up and she was like, yeah, you're tall, great. And she just started naming off all these names um, and I didn't have a clue who they were, like David Gandhi and all them. And obviously, we know who they are now. But, and she was like, right, I own Select Model Management and her name's Tandy. And she was like, come up on the 5th of Jan. And I was thinking... Is this real or she gave me a card and then on the fifth of Jan I went up there. I'll never forget I walked in the office, obviously there's a all the bookers, there's like eleven 
11 people on the table and Tony goes, get your top off. Wow. Like, what the fuck have I walked into here? But I mean, yeah, I mean, five years later, I've, um, I love it. I love modelling. Um, it's given me, a, it's given me a massive confidence um, in life. Yeah, because uh, there's more to it than just taking a picture, which people don't realise. Yeah, so I want to get onto that. So obviously, like, if you're good at sport, you're going to have a, a bit. Of, you're going to have confidence. Yeah. But if someone's telling you you're good looking and they want a brand who's going to pay you money to wear their clothes, I mean, surely. Sure, I mean, for me, if someone if someone gave me that privilege to say you're good looking, wear I know some some clothes from this brand. I mean, I even see your Panerai. You were, yeah, you were, I mean, I love my watches. I know you love your watches. Yeah. Panerai is a fucking big deal. Lovely. If someone told me to to model for them. My ego. I mean, you, I wouldn't be able to get out the door. I'm being honest. I'll be yeah. I'll be so like I am the guy. <laughs> it would be unbelievable. So so like. How, how was that feeling? Someone turned around to you. I mean, I mean, if I'm asking you a direct question, there, did you ever feel that you were a good-looking chap, or did you need that kind of validation by an agency? Say, so, you know what, Lewis, you're fucking no, good-looking. I mean, look, I mean look, I've, you know what? Funny enough, I've always struggled a little bit with confidence. Like, believe it or not, um, yes, I know, I know I'm not bad looking. Like, you're not bad looking, Steve. But do you know what I mean, so we're very fortunate. But I mean, yeah, I've never thought. You, Modeling's different. You don't have to be good looking. There's there's a hundred there's there's a million people in the world that look like you. So you've got to be a bit different. You don't, so you've got to have something else than just good looks, you know? Mm. Okay, so talk about like um all right, so to an outsider, they're gonna go, all you do is stand there and take a photo. Tell me a bit more depth behind what it takes to be a model. What it takes to be a model. I mean look. <sighs> So let's just say after here, we're going to go for a bit of dinner, I guess. And uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, you've got to keep in good shape. I mean, yeah. you're competing. Like, so, so select, for instance, there's 350 people on the books or whatever it is. I don't know how many, but they're, they're all unbelievable looking guys. They're all, like, if you look at Instagram, you look at these people, they're all ripped. So you think, bloody, I've got to be like that. Or So you, you're, you're always looking at someone else thinking, I've got to be that. Or But they're probably looking at you thinking the same thing. So you actually don't. You don't know, but you got to you got to make sure you're always on top of your game. You're ready. Your skin's fresh. You're in good shape. Um, is that a lot? Is that quite a lot of pressure? But even 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 weird stuff. I mean, when I started out, like she, she I had to look in, I had to look in the mirror, believe it or not, and like you had to plot, like do, do like model faces, like posing and get or getting your good a good angle. So if you take a picture, you know your good side and your bad side. So mm. every time you go into a casting, you got to make sure you're ready and you get a couple of shots to try and get win that job. Yeah. Uh, I used to work with a guy who uh, I've referred to a few times. Absolute lovely guy. One of the one of the sweetest guys you've ever met. This guy called Daniel Martin Ventura. Yeah, um, he's in good nick. He he's he? very good. I mean, he's ripped, uh, tan, dark hair. Fuck me, it sounds like I fancy him. But <laughs> 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 but I mean, he has got one of them like million dollar smiles. And uh, when he used to work with us, we used to like as a bit of banter, like you know, all try and throw, throw a pose. I can't remember Blue Steel. Is it that film? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we used to do it all the time. But he says, Steve, to be honest, you're not it's not far off the truth. We have to like go into a pose and mm. and you know come up with that kind of that kind of look. So is there any like I know if someone's getting into modelling for the first time, apart from being a good nick, looking after yourself, is there anything else? Any well, other yeah, bits of might, advice? I mean, yeah, you gotta be gotta be very natural in front of you gotta make sure so so for instance we're sitting in now, there's cameras on us, but you don't you, we don't realise the cameras. You got you you gotta do that. You can't realise you're taking a picture. It's just mm. gotta be you're walking down a street or you're sitting there and people are taking pictures around you, but you've got to just block that out. You've Would you say you've got, uh, you got, you, because when, when we've done some for stuff for Woodbury, you just seem so natural, but that might be because you've done it for some time. Yeah, I mean, I've done, done you, it for some time. Did yeah. you take to it like fairly, fairly well? No, I mean, I've, even now, mate. I mean, I'm, like, like I said, I, yeah, I've, I'm confident. I come across confident, but it's very, it's very, you, yeah, you have to be overly confident to be a to be a model because you're you're always in front of the camera and sometimes it makes you feel a bit I don't know a bit a bit shit sometimes you look at picture you think oh do I look like that but obviously you you look exactly the same <coughs> to everyone else but to you in yourself you look a bit different you're like very self critical yeah you know you you've got the good side you've got your bad side and uh, to everybody cool. else you you're just you're just Lewis or you're just that yeah, person it's always hard I mean you're walking into a casting you're always you're always nervous. So who who's been some of the biggest brands? So we ma mentioned man mentioned Panerai. Who else have you uh, modelled for? Um, Brooks Brothers probably one of my biggest. It's like a suit, American suit brand. Been going mm. for about two hundred years. That was amazing. I've done. How I've expensive done, their clothes? I don't 
don't know. Uh, you get a suit for maybe a grand, couple of grand. But it's, yeah, it's amazing. I've done a shoot in New York. Uh, one over here, actually. I shot for them three times, one in Iceland. But that's amazing. It was an amazing job, that. Great team. Um, I've been in Iceland. Very nice. Yeah, lovely. Panerai, obviously, you <coughs> said. I shot that in Milan. Um, I've done a few great hotels. Uh, one, obviously, you've been to, Punta Romana. Amazing, yeah. So when they rebrand the hotels, it's basically like a holiday. They give you, you go out there, they just shoot around you. Um, a couple of places in the Maldives, St. Regis Hotels. Um, Vela Private Island in the Maldives. You've got to check that one out, mate. Amazing. Yeah. Um, so where would you say the best place places you've been to because of the modelling? Got to be the Maldives. Yeah? Amazing. I mean, I've never been to the Maldives without, without modelling, so hopefully I'm going back in January. But yeah, that was amazing. I mean... So okay. Crystal Waters, because I've I've seen the pictures, but I've never been. I would oh. lo- love to go. Would you I'm say it's quite a romantic place to go yeah. to? I mean, not much to do. I mean, you little island. I mean, I remember getting up, running around the island. It took me five minutes to run around the whole thing. Wow! But it's amazing. I mean, you sit there, the sunset, the sunrise. Yeah. So just like tennis, I would imagine being a model, because I know probably one or two in my life, like like proper proper models. Yeah. Um, my cousin's mate, um, forgot his name now, is who we've seen outside Groucho a few times. What's his name? Oh, JC. JC, yeah. yeah. I, I, I don't know him so well. I know him via my cousin John, yeah. uh, but he's even travelled around the world. Um, yeah, I mean, he's, French he's, connection. One of, yeah, he's one of the best, mate, JC. Yeah. Very, very good. Um, but also modelling must have brought you a good network, you know, good. it must have connected you to, to some very good people. So who would you say that that's, that's brought into your space because of modelling? Yeah, I mean, there's a, yeah, I mean, Selex is a great one. I've only been with Selects. I can't obviously speak for other agencies, but I mean, Selects is like a family. So, mm. I mean, I've got, yeah, I've got loads of amazing friends from that now. Like, like you say, like JC's a good mate of mine. There's another guy called Sasha. I really, I'm really close with. You met Gandhi? Yeah, I met him once. I don't, I don't know him though. I mean, my, uh, Tandy, who owns our agency, she got married to Lawrence, um, in Mallorca. So we all flew out there, all of us. That was good fun. We were out there for about three days over the weekend. Yeah. That's where I met him, but, yeah, don't know him personally that well. Got uh, any more plans for modelling over the next couple of years? I'd love to. I mean, everyone has their goals. Um, I mean, yeah, I've, I'd love to do like a fragrance campaign, and I've, I guess everyone dreams of that. But yeah, I love modelling. It gives it gives you like doing a good picture or doing a good campaign gives you like that. Obviously, tennis like when you win matches, it gives you the same sort of feeling, you know, like doing mm. a good campaign, taking a good picture. Mm. So yeah, hopefully, I, I I get a lot more opportunities. Yeah, so. Uh, this next um, uh, sort of question or topic is what I've I've spoke to James Ward about. I spoke to Anton Ferdinand about Kim Richardson about multiple different people, people that are very similar age to myself and you. I'm obviously a bit older than you. I'm coming up to thirty five. I think you're twenty eight, twenty nine, twenty eight, twenty eight. So obviously you're you know a bit younger than me. But I've I knew life when I was I was old enough to know life without social media and without really the internet it was there the internet but it wasn't really you so much and now I'm in business I'm obviously doing podcasting and we have to use social media because there's no other way of getting out there really massive platform there's pros and cons to it the the pros are that you can uh, build yourself up in the right way you can get endorsements you can make money you can actually reach people and help them um because people do forget even though social media and i'm going to talk about this like the downside to it is mental health and stuff but the other side of it is there could be a kid on the other side of the world suffering and we could reach out to them and actually help them and put them on the right right path and people forget that yeah. also uh, charity work you know literally donating money to certain causes because without social media you might <laughs> never have found them um yes. there's you know there's plenty of celebrities or sports people that I've reached out to via social media and I've got them on onto my podcast and take the clock back 15 years ago 20 years ago that would never happen the only way I could have actually reached them is by knocking on their fucking their their, their door or stalking mm. them and yeah. that's as simple as that or going through their agent yeah. you've got a very very big following on Instagram you've actually got the blue tick um which which holds a lot of weight in these days um some some people actually pursue that probably more than money. I would say some people, if if they got a, if they got a vision on how they want their life to be, their roadmap might be get a good following, build up a good profile, get yep. that blue tick, and then convert it into business. Mm. But there is some pressure with that, uh, which people don't realise. So let, let, I want to ask you a question: like having 200, 200 followers basically on Instagram, um, the pluses and also downsides. What would you say about that? I mean. 
I mean, yeah, I mean, I got my follow followers from a from a very sad time in my life, so it's very difficult to kind of talk about that sort of yeah like my followers. I mean, look, I had a little bit before. You had a bit before, though, yeah. Before. And modelling. Um, I mean, yeah. I mean, it's, it's strange, isn't it? I mean, you've got you've got you've got people that like want to want to see what you're up to. I mean, it is is pretty strange, but mm. you got to use it to your your advantage, I guess. And and yeah, I mean, I don't really know what to say about that sort of. Because because like even even last night, I I mean, I got three thousand followers. I mean, it's fuck all in comparison to you, and it's even embarrassing even to uh, <laughs> to even trying to compare it, but. I still do get, because of the podcasting, I get people do hit me up quite a lot. And I even had a uh, a young man last night contact me. He's clearly a, a young entrepreneur or some kind of sales guy. And he was like, look, I'm looking for a mentor. And when, I, when, when people like that hit me up, it makes me feel good. Because even though I probably won't take up any... I don't class myself as a mentor. I'm not. I'm not. Ed, I'm not um, qualified enough. Maybe when I sell a company for hundred million, then I can call myself a mentor. But at the moment, but it's quite nice. But then I have. Uh, I've had other people say shit to me, and I don't ever retaliate back. Uh, back now because I don't want to waste my, my energy on it. But do you think there should be something out there that really monitors people that like, harassing people? Because well, I think well, it's, I mean, it's a bad. I mean, look, massive. A massive thing is everyone on social media should be should be verified. So yeah. like you say, I've got a blue tick, but ev- everyone should have a blue tick. If they're, you, you've got to make sure they're real. I mean, you have, there's so many fake accounts that people make fake accounts and start abusing you. It's just very, very strange. So I think in that respect, I mean, it would be good to to verify everyone that comes on. Mm. So you know exactly who they are. Because then, for, for example, if I didn't know you and, and, and we knew exactly who you are, would you, would you send me messages um, like disrespectful I, 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 ones. Yeah, like I mean, some of the things I get, I hope you die and all that sort of stuff. I mean, would, Crazy. If, if you're verified on Instagram or any social platform, would you be sending that to me? Probably not. But no. these people send me these messages with zero followers, zero posts, and it's just a bit like, what? What's what's the point? They. It's almost like they've set up that account purposely to be vicious. Because you don't. Because listen, I mean, you don't know what's going through someone's life. Mm. Yeah, I don't know what's going through yours. You don't. Yeah. So I think. What is the point of trying to bring? What, what is the point of uh, of harassing someone? You know, do you know what I mean? Because mm. you never know what's going to happen. Yeah, yeah. The outcome. The, the, the outcome. outcome do you know what I mean? Imagine, imagine that person. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Oh yeah. We, we've seen it many times. I mean. Yes. It is. It's, uh, well, this brings me on to uh, a company you're, at, you're actually uh, you know involved with now slightly. We're going to take it more seriously as time goes on. Mimboso, yeah. because part of the the wellness platform there is. It's to do with mindset. It's to do with outlook on life. It's to do with business. It's to do with strength, conditioning, training, competing, lifting, gym. It's to do with nutrition, which is the soul. So feeding your soul, food hacking, etc. But just like you said, you kind of have to be verified to be on that platform. The app is free now, but when we start doing the PR push and also yeah. the campaign, it's going to get larger and larger and larger. And it's for people not to, you can't follow people on it. You follow content. So it's only for people that want to bet their self will be on there. And it's unlike Instagram where Instagram promotes, tries to keep you on there for as long as possible. Our goal is to give you very, very good content, very valuable content that you can implement into your life. But then we actually tell you to get off the platform because we understand if you use social media for far too long, no matter how good it is for you, you get pulled into a virtual world, which ultimately is bad for your mental health. Mm. Um, I feel that more and more platforms like that should be out there. Um, and um, I think that's part of the reason why you you you, you sort of came towards the Mimboso platform yeah. as well. I mean, yeah, amazing amazing concept. Um, and yeah, like I was saying, people will be verified on it, and everyone will know everyone. There will be no people allowed to harass and all that sort of stuff. So I think it's a great great concept and what you what you built. Mm. Look, I do want to talk about the elephant in the room kind of scenario. Um, and obviously, I'm I'm going to be very very respectful towards it because it's it's you know it's even it's even tough for me to even ask you as a pal, but you know, you are you are known uh, socially and even in the media for going out with Caroline Flack. Um, she obviously was fucking a big, 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 big influencer herself. I never got to meet her, but I saw her on TV and she seemed like a f- fantastic girl. Obviously on Love Island and there were so many, so many cool things that she, that she did. So, you know, like when you met someone like that, you know, you, you got connected. Mm. Um, just like, I know, I know she was just like a girlfriend to you and like any, like, 
with me and my missus or, yeah. you know, you with any ex-partner or, or, or whoever else. It's, it's, it's just going to feel like a girlfriend. But when you go out day to day with someone like that and you're out in the public domain, you might go to a nice restaurant. What's it like? Is there like, do you feel that there's extra pressure there or is it good? Do you get a bit of kudos feeling because you're, you're going out with someone who's like a celebrity type person? What, what's that feeling like? Because the reason why I'm asking Lewis, I come from a normal background. You know my mum and dad's. You know my my mum's a black cab driver. Yeah. My dad's, you know, he's you know he's a bit of a willing dealer. He's a bit yeah. of a geezer. Yeah. And I never felt when I was younger I was ever going to really. I wanted to be in business, and I never felt like I was ever going to be a celebrity. I never felt like I was ever going to meet a celebrity. I just felt like I was going to be a like a normal background. Mm. So when I meet another normal geezer like you, yeah. and you start going out with a celebrity, that for me is like fucking that's cool. And also, what was that feeling like? Do you know what? I mean, what? however you think it feels like is the total opposite. Really? I mean, I mean, yeah, I mean, you've, I mean, if you've got like cameras in your face, it makes you feel very vulnerable. Like you, I mean, for me personally, I know it sounds a bit weird. It made you like half panic a little bit because you, there's like, what's that, anxiety and anxiety, stuff. Anxiety, yeah. I mean, you're coming out of a restaurant and then it's like everyone's in your face. It's like, quite. And you always got to wash over your wash over your shoulder, like what are you doing? Are you arguing in public, or are you doing this or doing that? Because you never know when someone's there. They, they, I mean, they hide. Yeah, because obviously this is um, like even with the social media stuff, we use it anyway to like just show our friends, and you know, it's just it's just a bit of a feel good thing. When you when you do a story, there's a dopamine drop in your in your body, and it's kind of addictive. It's a bit of a drug using social media, yeah. for sure. But the downside to that, if you're a high profile person, I mean, you've got a very, very good following. She obviously had a fantastic following. She was also famous in the media a lot. So the moment you do something, they're outside that restaurant, like Sexy Fish, for example. So when you came out and there was the paparazzi and all that and asked you questions, and they was even trying to provo provoke uh, certain stories from you a couple of times. Yeah, I mean, it's not... It's, I mean, yeah, you can't, you can't fight the media, I don't think. I mean... They're just, they're ruthless people. I think, obviously, everyone, no, I mean, if you look at the papers now, there's no there's no positive stories. It's all, everything's negative. No, and it's, it's funny how the human works. I mean, everyone wants to know what, what, what bad's happened in the day. You don't, you don't go home and go, what, what, what good's happened in the world today? Mm. So they just, they just, they just print or, the news is everything that's negative about the world. It's not like it's like coronavirus, for instance. It's not like right. We've, there's a thousand people that's been saved today. Yeah. It's always like there's three hundred people that's died. But there's obviously there must be good stuff going on. <coughs> yeah. It's just the news and the media. They just they drain you with negativity stuff, and it's getting it scares it scares people. Yeah. Well, I think I think that comparison between uh, certain stories and also the coronavirus is spot on because you've got. 99.9% .9 people survive in it, but they don't report that. But then they report a very, very small min minority that may catch it. And very, very small of population of those end up dying. And don't get me wrong, it's a, it's a terrible thing. But like you said, why don't they actually report very, very good news? I mean, the problem is as well with, with, with media. I mean, I, I mean it's, you, yeah, like I said, you, you can't fight them. There's just no point. You're not going to get nothing out of it. But I mean, some, some of the stories they, they do are just totally wrong. Yeah. So, or they have some sort of... Say, for instance, they, they have some sort of truth and then they just write so much bullshit around it. And it's like, what's that about? They over-exaggerate the truth or they draw out the truth or they, they dovetail it into another narrative and they always got this ulterior motive. I mean, look, I've told you before off, offline, I've had shit written about me mm -hmm. and there'll be one pocket. You make one, you, you'll say this whole thing and they'll take one small statement and they'll put their own interpretation of it. it. Oh, that person doesn't care. And it's all, it's, it's bollocks. And I would think to myself, well, I never even spoke to that person, but you're writing a story like I've spoken to you, then, which is crazy. And, and the same time as well. I mean, obviously being in the, being in the public eye, pe people can sell stories on you. I mean, like for instance, you, I mean, if I, if I sent you a message or if you knew me, you could, I, I don't really know how it works. I don't know how you do it. Cause I've, that, I've, I think people that do that, the complete lowest of the low. But people can they can they can bring in or, they, or however they do it like I said, and they can sell a story on you, like saying I know Lewis, I know he done this, I know Steve, he done this, and then and they, and they, if they've got a strong source, they'd print it, mm. and it's just and that phone call. I mean, 
or, or the message that you get from whoever your agent that can tell you that story because they've got to tell you that stories come out and and they go oh there's a story being printed to you tomorrow you don't have a clue what it is so you're, what, thi- so that, you're thinking that? so you so imagine how you're feeling you've got to go to bed at night and thinking there's a story on so, so obviously sunday is the, be- the best time to print a very big story and you don't know what the stories come out of i mean you could be out the night before or something, and then you or something. You, you could do anything, anything, little little thing, stupid, and you don't know what it is until the, until it's printed. Mm. So. It, do, you, do you feel like like even if you go out tonight somewhere for a, for a, for a meal, do you feel like you have to kind of not watch your back, but kind of watch how you're acting around people or how someone can interpret? Because you could put your arm around a girl. And suddenly they will say, "Oh, he found a new lover, or he's yeah, doing this no. and doing that," and it's and it's bollocks. It's just a friend. You might be yeah. just seeing a friend, for I example. I mean, not, not so much now with me, but like obviously, yeah, it did. I a bit, bit, a bit of time in my life when it was like, oh, I've got to be careful. I talk to what I do, and it was just horrible. So I mean, imagine, and and that's me, and that's and and I'm 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 a no one. So imagine, imagine being someone like. For example, your David Beckham's or your, your Andy Murray's. I mean, imagine that. They can't, mm. You wouldn't be able to go out in public. <clears throat> or if you did. I mean, like you said, if I'm sitting at a bar and, and talking about a personal, personal situation with you, you have to be so careful who's around you. Yeah. It's Someone might be here, we can on the table next year. And then the next day, you know, it's in the paper. Or they've got... A, or they're recording you or something. You know? it, it must be um, if, if when your agent calls you and says there's a story about to be run oh, tomorrow the word, and, the they, and they give you a small snippet of maybe yeah. what it could be, I mean, that must... And, and the problem is, so so they know there's a story running tomorrow, but then you can squash them stories with selling something else. That's how mad it is. That, like, so, it's well, almost not, outbidding each other for yeah, the best so story. Like, so if you give me this, I'll change the headline of that. Or, for example... It's a bit like blackmail. It's absolutely uh, unbelievable. I mean, I, c- I can't explain it. Obviously, I've been, I've been, yeah. I mean, I've had a terrible time with it all, but it's just um, unbelievable how it makes you feel. I mean, it may, yeah, the the feeling inside that you have when they say, right, there's a story coming out. Yeah, they're always on you. It's just it's horrible. You feel, well, like, you feel like there's no escape. I, well, I mean, even when we done our show uh, for Woodbury House over at Porto Romano in the owners' club there, which was very, very successful. I mean, even the first day I got there, mm-hmm. I think uh, my mum said, "Oh, Steve, have you seen <laughs> your name's in the paper?" And it was in the paper because they were mentioning you. But because we were there together, it's like pal, Steve. So, and as I was reading it, it said professional tennis coach Lewis Burton. And I went, "What?" I got yeah. Fuck it, they got that completely wrong. And I don't think I've ever coached anyone in my life. Th- does that does that frustrate you when they they kind of make up stuff or they assume stuff? Is that is that well, quite frustrating? Do you know what? I mean, I mean, yeah, it takes a lot to hold your tongue or to, like, bite your tongue. But it's like I know, I know me, I know the truth, I know everything. Do you know what I mean? As long as you're happy in yourself and you know you, and you know the truth, it's, it's not. You don't really need. Well, yeah, sometimes it's difficult, but you don't really need to kind of justify yourself. Yeah, it's like I'm I'm Lewis. I know. I, I mean, I know me. Why well, do I need to kind of correct everyone? Or yeah, but it sometimes gets tough. Obviously, there's a few stories out there that are very difficult. But is what it is. is it, are, they, are they true or false? It, it's irrelevant. Mm. So, I, do you know what I mean, I'm fighting. I'm you're going up against the world. Like some people don't read that. Some people do. As long as I know the truth and I can hold my head up higher, that's that's the main thing I think for me. Yeah, exactly. Um, as you well know, my podcast, the Steve Vasali Study, is talking to people that I consider inspiring, and you, you you definitely are. I mean, even coming on the podcast inspires me because you're, you're you've 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 come on and spoke about certain certain things in your life, which is quite difficult, which I fucking really respect. I love athletes, model. I think you're the first model I've had on air, etc. Um, what I'm getting to is. You know, even challenges in people's lives, I like to know how they, they how they got over it, like mentally, or how you're dealing with it. Because I might go through a scenario like that in my life. God forbid it happens, but it could happen. But there's going to be an audience out there today that think, you know what, I've lost someone. I've gone through that. And I have no idea how to get through it. And now I'm hearing it from mm-hmm. someone like yourself. They're going to go, okay, yeah, I, I really, really respect that. And it's really helped me. Listen, I'm going to ask you a very hard question, but it's going to c- come with great positivity. When you found out, that she had passed away. What was, what what went through your mind, and how do you think you sort of sort of uh, got over the first few days? God. Mate, it's just 
Do you know what? Even like you saying that, it's just hard. You know what I mean? I mean, can, can I ask, ask you a question? I mean, I mean, she was obviously your 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 missus, and you obviously you seemed like you were getting on super well together. Was you in love with her? Was yeah, you, yeah. I mean, I, I knew her as. Did you have plans like for the future, like maybe no, married and kids no, and that, or was it plans. too, uh, too early? It was, it, at that time, what we were going through was just so difficult. You couldn't really see a way out. Obviously, she couldn't, unfortunately. But you, it's 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 a very it's a very difficult situation. I mean, I haven't talk, oh, I don't talk about it. I just kind of put it put it in the back of my head, and you just kind of get on with it. But I mean, yeah, I mean, when I got that phone call, it was just you felt like you. Yeah, you felt like your life was just done. I mean, I, I was, I, you know, I, I was away at the time. I was in, I was skiing. I just dropped to the floor. I'll never forget it. I'll never forget it. I've, Joe, you, know, you think about it every day. You, know, I'll never forget it. To be honest with you. Um, I even I like this is no comparison, but like in last recent years, I've obviously lost my nan. But the difference was. She entered hospital, and it was almost a matter of time. And you were seeing her like sitting there uh, deteriorating. And even though you know it was still hard, at the end of it, with me and my family, it was almost like it's right for her to go now. Obviously, she's lived a good life. She was ninety-seven or ninety-eight, and it was still even hard. But for someone so young, as like Caroline was, and it, like it wasn't her right time. And because of that, it, it was that a little bit more harder to take on the chin almost. Do you know what is it? Do you know what's hard? It's just, it's just how, it's just, a, it's such a shame that in a in her head, she couldn't see her way out. You know. I mean, I mean, you must be I now. Mean, yeah, I mean, look, that's that's mental health for you. But I mean, as, as she if she just knew that like it passes, you know, everything passes. I, st- I she had me. I was standing by. You know, it's just it's heartbreaking, mate. Really, you know. Mm. But it is what it is. I mean, you got to just see if, hope that she's in a better place. Um, I mean, for me, I mean, uh, I mean it's going to live for me. For, I think, like I said, I think, I think about every single day still. Mm. But y- you deal with it. You know what I mean? It's just, is it right or wrong how how people deal with it? No, it's just I, I, I don't know how to deal with it. I'm just dealing with it how how I know. You know, and and I'm I'm getting by. Obviously, I've had I'm lucky that I've got amazing family and friends. Um, I've got a lovely girlfriend now that, that supports me massively. Um, like you, you and Joey made a, played a massive part in my life. For that obviously, I've got another. I've, and I just, you know what? It's just every day you just you got it. Mate, my my outlook on life is just totally different. I mean, kind of one, one, one minute, one minute, one minute of one minute you you with someone, the next minute they're gone. You know, like so. 10 minutes within a, within a 10 minute space of speaking to someone on the phone to you're never going to see him again it's just oh mate it's fucking mad yeah mate like listen I'd, I'm, it's just so hard I mean, even. Uh, and then it, yeah I mean what? Uh, yeah I just, you can't explain it mate it's just, it is what it is I mean it's, it's changed my life I mean every, every everything now that I do I'm worried you worry so like you, um, I worry when I leave the house, will I will I see that person again? Or you, yeah, that's I worry every day now. Like if I get a phone call, like f- for example, like my mum rang me last night about nine thirty in the morning in the evening, and I'm fucking panicking on the phone, or like I'm thinking I don't want to answer that. And that's what that's what, that, and I'm very very jumpy now. I am so like it's like if some yeah, random stuff, like I jump uh, everything. Yeah, she's not obviously not nice, but. It's difficult. I mean, yeah. I mean, I moved in with my brother. My brother was by my side for everything, and they, having good people just gets you through it, you know. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a big believer as well. Like you said, everything does pass, and nothing lasts forever. And that's including good times and also bad times. Everything evolves. You need the bad times to have good times. You need good times to have the bad times. Um, but I do believe in therapy, and I think a very basic form of that is talking about it. And yeah, I mean, I, yeah, like even coming on this, like just even just talking about that now. Obviously, up until this, I was worried about this, but obviously now talking now, I feel a little bit like the weights slightly weights gone. kind of lifted a little bit, which is I feel like a bit more relaxed now. But because you yeah. know what, as well, like th- th- there are people that are gonna not necessarily a person; it could even be lose a business or something, and people go into depression. 
I'm not saying you're an expert on it, but you could easily, people could easily start going onto the drugs drink and doing crazy stuff. Is there anything like, if people are going through a certain situation very similar to what you went through, is there anything you could say to kind of steer people away from the bad and steer them into the good? Yeah, do you know, do you know what it is? It's, it's just advice, basically, yeah, I'm trying to get right. at. So I'm obviously very lucky that I've had a sport that all I know, all I know is tennis and fitness and... That's all I know. Obviously, a bit of business now, but you have to just you have to put yourself with good people. I mean, I mean, I'd have, I'm lucky. I've got an amazing family that just stood by me. But then I just trained. I I threw myself into work. That's how I dealt with it. I mean, it was literally like a week later, and I was just working, training, and you're kind of going through the motions, but. The, like there's, there's no right or wrong but I was yeah like I said I was with you every day or with my family it's just being around people like you it's not being selfish because you feel like you're a bit of a burden on them thinking oh bloody hell like I'm upset I'm crying again or I'm doing this but you have to just think past that and just use everyone you can to just give you pick you up again because you, you I was on the floor mate literally um, and you see, you feel like there's no way out yourself but then luckily like you look around I've got my brother's got three lovely kids and every day, every morning they come and they jump to my bed, waking me up, you know. I couldn't really sleep, but like having that around, like the love, it's, it's love, mate, basically. Mm. Just having that around you just picks you up and and just seeing your purpose in life. Mm. And I know, it's, I know it's easy and I know it's difficult for others and they might not be as fortunate having a family or friends like I have, but you have to just, or even if it's that one person, just, just make sure you, you're with them or stick with them and just do everything you can in your power to just get see the light. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Obviously, I want to be very, very respectful about this whole situation. I'm going to move on slightly, but just want to ask you one more thing then, sort of stepping back a little bit to what we were saying earlier. After that happened, there was obviously some fucking haters and trolls started sending you messages. And obviously, there would have been some nice ones and there was some bad ones. I mean, what was it? Was almost like a double double whammy. You've lost the person that you're with and you love, and almost your your your, 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 your companion. Mm. And I don't even know what it feels like. I mean, if I ever lost my my missus, I'll be fucking broken. Um, but then on top of that, because you have got that profile, people are now attacking you. I mean, it's just it's just horrendous. I mean, that, that, yeah, I, yeah. I, 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 John, what it is it, it, you don't know how strong you are until you have to be until that's the only thing you got, right? Um, <laughs> I can't it's very hard to explain I mean you get these messages yeah that they're attacking you or, or people or, or like people would look at me right and be like I don't want to name name names but like people would say I've done something wrong I've done this wrong or I've done that wrong like there is no right or wrong like there I I, I had to get through something that was or I'm getting I'm, I mean I'll, I'll, have, to still I'll have to get through it I'll have to get through it for the rest of my life that's a fact so and I, <coughs> and, and, and I wish God forbid it ever happens to anyone because it's the it's, it's, it'll be, it's the worst thing ever well it's going to be yeah obviously it's the worst thing in my life but mm. how how I got through it is 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 how I got through it I mm. mean you if it happened to you you'd, you'd get through it completely different Steve you know mm. Other, someone else would get through it. So for people to come come at me or, or come at people saying, I've done that wrong, I've done this wrong, I've done that, well, you don't have a fucking clue, you know what I mean? That's that's what's really frustrating. That's what upsets me the most. Because then I do, because you, like you said, you're your own worst critic and you think, bloody hell, have I done that wrong? Because like, I class myself as a nice fella, right? I, I want everyone to, I, I don't dislike anyone, do you know what I mean? I, I haven't got the energy for that. So for, for someone saying that to me, thinking, and I think, well, I, did I do that wrong? No, I wish I'd done that different. But like, if I'd done that different, I might have been. I might not be sitting here today, Steve. You know, mm. I might be in the in the dump so I might not be here. Mm. And I'm very good. Like, I'm, and my outlook on life now is just, I'm grateful for everything. Everything. Do you know what I mean? Even you don't. You don't. I don't. Do you know what I mean? I want. I want a lot of stuff, but I don't need anything. I've got everything I've got. I've got my family. I've got my friends. That's all I need. Yeah. Everything else is a bonus for me now. You know. Yeah. Um, what you just said there about, I mean, like I said, my mum and dad assumed that I was friends with you for a long time and they always yeah. say the same thing what a lovely guy is even my mum's boyfriend he can stop going on about you um, and um, even my brother went through something recently and you've been there you know you've been there like he's like he's your brother you know you 
without even me there, you're going for, for walks with him. Uh, it's a bit like therapy for, for yeah. him and taking him out for a walk on a Sunday. Don't worry, it, mate. It, help, it, help, it helps me helping people. Yeah. I mean, because obviously I know how, how shit I felt. Or, and like, when, mate, when you're feeling good, every, everyone's there, you know? It's just the people when, when you're feeling shit, that's when you know who's there. That's the that's, that's big thing for me. Yeah. And obviously, yeah, like, I mean, I'll be there for anyone, even if I don't know you. If I think... You need a bit of support. That's that's me, and it make me. It makes me feel a lot better, mate. Yeah, it's the old saying, or a saying that we've used in. It's been around the sales environment, which is adversity doesn't build character; it reveals it. And when you're going through adversity, when your company or people are going through adver- adversity, the so-called friends or the people that are meant to be around you, and meant to be solid, sometimes they're actually the ones that fuck off, and they, they they're not there for you. And um, like I said, I mean, I've only known you really for a relatively short part of my life, but you've been there for me and my, and my family. And um, yeah, I just respect you coming on the podcast, bro, and um, and, and and talking there and, and being oh, a really good friend. Cheers. So let's move on. Look, you, you're now a business person, or you've been a business per- person for some time. Your trading company. Yeah. Um, talk me, talk to me a little bit about that. It's an educational company, right? Yeah, educational and kind of wealth management, finance. Um, I set up with a, a business partner of mine, Steve and Bradley. Um, that was basically after I stopped playing tennis. Really, I was lucky, so I started trading. Um, well, I went on a, co- a, a course when I was when I stopped playing tennis. Obviously, I'd done the modelling, then I then I I'd done a course in trading. So about one to two years, I was a trader, made a bit of money, <coughs> got a buy. Um, and then I spoke to Brad one day. And I was like, "Look, let's set up a business. There's a massive market <coughs> for this." And um, and yeah, we set up. Uh, educate to trade and trade inbox ones yeah ones regulated um and yeah we've we've been going five six years now it's, a, it's an amazing amazing company i've just got a new investor on um and yeah hopefully hopefully big things are going to happen in in 2021 for that company so we've like um i've got a few traders i've got a couple of guys from icap who are clients collectors of richard hamilton for woodbury house yep. And a lot of trade to the to the to the mass market to normal people, recession instability is not a good thing. But to traders, it's actually really good because when there's movement, you can make money. Yeah. Um, how is the trading market benefiting from the ebbs and flows of the recession and coronavirus? I mean, we we do great because we're day traders, so we trade uh, all uncertainty. I mean, like Trump, Brexit. I mean, that that's great for us. I mean, when the markets are very like they so mentioned the vaccine and then suddenly something happens. But it's, but it's, great for, it's great for the art market as well. I mean, uncertainty is great. Yeah, it is uh, very much it depends, so. Yeah, I mean, if you're, if you're, if you're in a long-term stock and coronavirus hit, you're fucked. We're day traders, we're in and out. So we, we make money on bad news and good news. It's not, if, if it's just good news, then day traders are, uh, are fucked, really. Okay. Just, or every fund and stock's doing well. Yeah, yeah, okay. So you help people learn um how to trade yeah so yeah we've got uh, and is lo- it di- loads of courses from beginners um beginner courses people that know nothing or actually f- proper traders that um been in the city for years we we cater for everyone and in your own words or your own opinion i mean i've seen uh, a few youngish guys in the papers and again this is going back to papers like make it like making these people look probably bigger than they are but they appear to have the life you know like a celebrity type lifestyle they're flying around private jets making money but how how hard is it really to be a become a phenomenal trader or how easy is it no, i mean it's very hard you've got to have the right mentors but i mean look again that stuff on instagram take mm. it as a pinch of salt yeah a lot of these people don't really know how to trade I mean, they're they're good marketers. I mean, look, if someone driving around in this amazing car got an amazing watch, you think bloody hell, I want to do what he does. But in hindsight, they they actually look. I don't want to speak bad about anyone, but they don't really do that. They're just marketers that yeah, they pass promote. their business through through other other companies. But I mean, yeah, it's hard. It's like everything. You've got to put your mind to it. You've got to have the right mentor. Um, Is it also what I because someone I had a little taster of it i used to work with a guy in sales and when we used to go back to his house i think it was like a wednesday or thursday thursday after we'd done the gym session just go back then and, and eat and i'll go home but he also used to do trading on the side and he showed me a couple of things like pips and all that kind of stuff and yeah you know um, no, no, yeah i mean my, my business partner was vice president at barclays wealth right. management so he's been in and around the markets for 25 years so he he knows he knows it inside out so yeah 
that's what we kind of do, mate, really. We kind of mentor people, uh, educate people about the market. Even if even if you, you just want to invest, you don't even want to get into trading. You, it, to, to have the knowledge about the, the world is, is a massive thing. Yeah. Well, what I was getting at is he used to say to me, he said, yeah, the, the skills and the knowledge and everything else is important. And don't get me wrong, you need to have it. But he said, do you know what this game comes down to, Steve? And I went, what? He said, it's about dealing with your emotion. Because if your emotion gets a better of you, you can actually lose a shit ton yeah, of money. You attached to your money. Yeah. You? So, I mean, it's, it's like... Or responding yeah. to the news too badly or... Yeah, I mean, like, if you're getting a trade, you should know where your stop loss is and you should know where your take profit is. I mean, you shouldn't... Get too greedy. Yeah, I mean, if it hits... Take, you, 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 know, you know what you're... You know, basically, what you do, what you know guaranteed, you know what you're losing when you're going into that trade because you put your stop loss in. So, say, for instance, it's a £1,000. You know in your head you're going to lose a £1,000. You can't predict the market's going to go up, but you have to... You put you put in yeah you have the kind of knowledge that you think it is. It's yeah. like betting. It's like betting on football, really. You know that Man United is probably going to beat someone in the conference, didn't you? Yeah. So yeah. you probably lump on them. <laughs> same yeah. the same sort of thing, really. Yeah. Uh, and now, obviously, you've been with us for some time. Your partner Wood- Woodbury House. Yeah. Um, you brought a lot to the table already. I mean, clients, of course. Um, we done the show in Porto Romano. There's yep. there's a scope for us to do a show over in um, New York next year. Yep. But apart from, you know, let's say knowing my business partner, Joe, you're very good friends with him, um, and obviously seeing Woodbury House and also our private studio here, what sort of attracted you towards the art market? Why did Mate, you like Hamilton? I've, I've, always, I've always loved art, to be honest with you. I'm not, obviously, I'm not just saying that because I'm sitting in Woodbury yeah. House. I've, I've loved it. Um, people, people know me, loved art. Um, and again, you gave me an opportunity um, to, to, to come up here to see talk about Hamilton obviously I fell in love with with Richard Hamilton like you did when you and you gave me the opportunity this year and I've just I kind of fell in love with it mate and and it's been it's an amazing business for me because I've got all these all these massive connections around the world and obviously you need kind of like a a platform to kind of help them invest or make money or or show them a good good investment I mean Hamilton is amazing right Mm. and I'd like to do loads of shows around the world. Like, like for instance, we've done one in Marbella. <coughs> We're going to do one in New York, hopefully. We're going to do one in LA. We're going to do multiple ones in, in the UK. And I think it's it's amazing, amazing platform for me to, and, and the people that I know. Yeah. And again, I don't want it to sound like, you know, stage or anything else, but we are talking about Hamilton. I mean, in your, in your opinion, where, where can you see this market going over the next few years based upon what you know? Because I've been in it seven years now, so I've got a bit of the blinkers on. Yeah. I, I believe what I believe, but for someone fairly new to it still, you've been in it for a year or so. I mean, look, listen, if, if, if you're half clever and you look at his predecessors and, and logic suggests that his market's going to catch up with them, so... Yes, I, I think personally it's going to go through the roof. Obviously, you haven't paid me to say that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it just yeah, you just know it. You know it is. You just you do your research, right? It's, it kind of it sells itself. Yeah. Basically. Um, I don't know how you would kind of sell yourself or identify yourself, but like, what I mean, uh, model or uh, so, like an influencer or a tennis player. I mean, what what would you say your 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 best characteristics are now as an individual? Um, I don't know. I think I, I think I'm very much of a people's person. So um, I, I attract good. Uh, well, I'm a good networker. I mean, I've got loads of friends. Every when I go out, I meet so many interesting people. So I think having having multiple different avenues in in my life for, for business sort of purposes, I think that's great. And I think I'm very lucky that um, I've been I've been traveling around the world and, and met amazing people. Yeah, yeah. I definitely would second that. I mean, some of the people you've brought to the table and some of the people you've kept connected us to, I, I think to myself, how the hell has he met that person? I mean, yeah, I mean, like that's, that, for example, obviously you, you give me the opportunity to come, come on board at Woodbury House. I mean, you, I, mean I, 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 I went down my phone book and I see, obviously I don't want to name names, but the people that I brought to the table, they, they wouldn't be interested in something else that I've got, but they're, they're all over the art, loved art. So like the... The top, the wealthy, really wealthy people are very interested in this in the art market. It's, it's amazing. Yeah. All right. Um, where can people find you if you want them to find you? Uh, <laughs> nowhere. Um, <laughs> Instagram. Yeah. Uh, follow me on Instagram. Find me in Woodbury House. <laughs> Archer Street. Yeah. Um, 
60 fish, 60 Dean, fish Dean Street Dean Townhouse. Street, uh, yeah. <laughs> You have a number if you want. <laughs> <laughs> All right, nice one. Um, as you well know, I've got a cat phrase, be happy, never content. I want to ask you your version of that. What do you think be happy, never content means to Lewis Burton? Um, yeah, I mean, appreciate your life, be very happy, but yeah, don't 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 be settled. Always always want more out of your life. Um, but yeah, be grateful and appreciate, appreciative on the way. Wicked, mate. Thank you very much. Um, I hope everyone's been uh, enjoying enjoying these uh, these episodes. I, f- I felt this one's really, really impactful. Um, please subscribe to the YouTube. Please make a comment. Positive ones only. Otherwise, you're getting fucking blocked. And um, be happy, never content. Lewis, nice one, brother. Thank you very much, mate. Thank you. Appreciate it.